We're on The Creators and it's so great today. I have a very wonderful guest, somebody who I think is very important to listen to and to get to know, um, Art Deco. Hi. Hi. So nice to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say right from the top, um, well, I didn't actually say it, a magazine said it. In fact, it was Impose Magazine said, Annie Lennox would be proud mm -hmm. of your new um, project. And I think one of the reasons is because you, you really blur the lines of um, sexuality and androgyny within music, and which is very similar to what Annie Lennox was doing and my hero, David Bowie, as well. Um, you're, you've really put in the show back into show business in a sense with, with um, this persona. So can you speak to me a little bit about this persona and, and what it is? Well, uh, or who you, it is? Yeah, well, thank who you, you for, are. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, I'm a big fan of both those uh, artists as well. Um, I think the uh, what kind of set it off is someone early on listening to to the album before I'd even uh, released it said, you know, art. It's great, but who's the girl singing on all these songs? And it kind of just dawned on me. I was like. I already sound like a woman, um, and most of my favorite rock stars from multiple generations, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, even now, are female fronted. And I thought, you know what, why not just, just mess around with it? And uh, so I started to have a little bit of fun with, with, the, with, with expressing myself through that kind of language, through that kind of image. And, it's just, it's me, it's art. I don't, I don't look at the front cover of Day Fevers and really identify with that scruffy faced man in the leather jacket. This is kind of who I feel. This it kind of embodies and personifies the sound of the music, which has always been like a sense of um, alienation and isolation. And I spent a long, a long time creating the album by myself. Mm -hmm. So, I was my own worst enemy in that, and finally when I get to present it to the world, it was like a new learning curve, like how am I gonna, how am I gonna express myself on stage? Because that's right. a different arena, you mm -hmm. know, than the studio one, so. What is the separation there about the character and, and what you can get, get extra as a boost as an artist mm -hmm. from going into a David Bowie um, character or an Art Deco character in your mm -hmm. case? Well, at this point, I don't even feel like it's a character. It's just a, a kind of a dress I slip onto before going on stage. Um, and when I'm on stage, in the past, I've never really felt comfortable. And I think that that, that breadth of insecurity kind of just, it leaves a weird like film on your teeth. And I wanted to, wanted to brush that off and start fresh. Right. So uh, the way that the songs sound already um, and the way that they're played live, I wanted to get, I wanted to inject a new flavor into it. So it, it's malleable and it's constantly moving and mm -hmm. this is just today, who knows what tomorrow's gonna be, you know? Yeah. Very impulsive, so yes. it changes a lot. Um, we talked about, previous to this interview starting, we talked about in the early 60s and, and uh, or sorry, late 60s, early 70s, um, even the late, uh, with the bands like The Clash and The Blondies and the Eurythmics and all that, there was, uh, it wasn't so much about blurring the lines of sexuality, it was more, more about the energy of, you know, um, sort of screw the old guard, we're, we're being progressive, punk sensibilities, questioning authority. Mm -hmm. um, so does this play into your music a bit with this character as well? Uh, well, back in the early 80s or the late 70s, which is one of my favorite eras, um, you know, even before that, you have like the birthplace, like New York 70 in the late 70s to me is such a magical time. I'm sure people that actually live there would probably say it was, you know, you have CBGB, you have the birthplace of punk, and then how that kind of fanned the flames overseas, and then you have disco in Studio 54, and then you've got in the Bronx this hip hop movement happening. So, really, three of the most important or groundbreaking genres of the last, I don't know, 50 years in pop music were kind of created out of this almost dystopian kind of place to be, right? With insurance claims and fire buildings being let on fire. And, you know, if you look at old videos, it looked like a war zone and all this great art was coming out of it. Um, out it of was despair. like the Escape from New York, a movie. It there really was. And then how that kind of turned into, how it bred into the, spread into the MTV realm of, 
you know, uh, all these pop bands, I really feel like the fringe infiltrated the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like I mentioned, the Smiths and the Eurythmics and all these other great bands and the British Invasion. And it's just, it was a magical time to be creative. And all the common through line on all of those bands is that they were really, um, kind of going against the man, going against the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Like Adam and the Ants is wearing makeup and same with Robert Smith because it was like how they wanted to personify their feelings. Right. No, and it's, it, it's a great visual. It's a great visual and it's, it's quirky and it's weird and it's avant-garde and it's dangerous and I feel like that was, those are the bands I look up to and you know how, how you look on stage and how you market yourself as, a, as an artist is very important because it's the first thing people kind of people kind of listen with their eyes, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, all my favorite bands kind of play around with sexuality and they play around with their image, and it's there's nothing clandestine and kind of safe about it. It's very uh, right. unique to how their music sounds, which is different. You've created this character. Your people want to do they not? They want to live through the artists a lot when they go see a show, mm -hmm. or they're looking at them on stage going, man, I'm really digging what they're doing because they've become everything I'd wish I could be or had the guts to do it. Which, mm -hmm. which brings me to being an artist at a core. You were an artist first. So how do you, where did that spark come from you to be Art Deco mm -hmm. and also to be an artist and go for it? I was, well, three years ago, more now, I was living in Vancouver and I was very burnt out. I was playing in other people's bands, which were great experiences, wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, but I never really had a creative outlet where I can just kind of unleash on my feelings and, and throw them at a wall and whatever stuck, stuck. And I kind of got very bored of show business or the music industry, so I left. And I moved far away from the metropolitan downtown city life, the debauchery. You live on an island. I live on an island, a golf island, and you know, it's just remote to get to, and it was a total culture shock, and I spent a lot of time uh, just bunkering down and not thinking about music. I actually sold all my guitars. I didn't even listen to music. And then, I mean, to be to get kind of personal with you, <laughs> I feel like we're close. Well, it's on TV, no one's watching. Oh, right? Well, there you go. Uh, my grandmother, whom I was, I was renting, uh, she had this orchard and it overlooked a lake in the forest. It was very beautiful and she had Alzheimer's. And there's this condition that certain Alzheimer's patients get called um, sundowning is what it's called. And anybody that's been around someone who has Alzheimer's who suffers from the sundowning, it's a great sense of anxiety that comes at sunset. Oh. And immediately, uh, the only way to get her off of these anxieties um, until help came, which was her regular routine. Um, I would come upstairs and I'd play piano for her. Oh, and, wow. You know, you, she could never really remember my name, you, no matter how many times I said it. She forgot large swaths of her life were completely wiped clean from her mental hard drive. Yet here I am playing Fear Elise by Beethoven. She's singing along melodically, perfectly, and it's right. this bizarre, like, instance where someone can't remember so much about their own life yet music mm -hmm. and melody still has a place in their brain right um, and I mean that kind of struck a real raw no pun intended chord with me and when she finally left I was the caretaker of her yard and I would just spend hours on that piano kind of retraining myself to like music again for me right and uh, and even just the name day fever is the album uh, is kind of an homage to sundowning, day fever, is this mm. idea of starting with sunrise, which the album does, and sunset, how it ends, and right. this kind of, uh, throughout the day, this kind of all these stories that would unfold. That's, mm. a, that's a beautiful story. Oh, thank you. Um, speaking of day fever, yeah. just jumping right to it. So you had some really great success. You've bridged the gap over the border. You're into the States now. You're, you're seeing some international success. Yeah. Uh, what do you think's tapping in uh, to that market for you? I think that... Uh, Other than the songs, because the songs are great. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, the album um, was, it, it kind of snowballed from that story about you know the whole kind of moving to the island. I think music is best, I mean, to paraphrase John Lennon, uh, you know, 
the, how to write a great song. There's really, there's formulas, there's books on it, there's teachers that will try and teach you that, but at the essence of a truly great song, among many things, is, you know, tell the truth, make it rhyme, and put it to a beat. And uh, at that point, I was starting to feel some pretty messed up feelings about where I was at, and I was trying to, I was trying to kind of overcome regret, like why did I move here? What am I, what am I doing with my life? I needed to figure things out. And in that personal kind of, it was the winter when I moved, so it was very cold and, and dreary out. And as, as I was kind of exploring the, the mountains and the trails, and I was just throwing the earbuds on and slowly appreciating music again, and thinking like, I, this is therapy for me. What if I could kind of transcribe my own music and have that at my fingertips? Right. So you really, you really ought to do it for yourself first. And that's kind of where mm -hmm. Day Fevers came from. This, this natural, organic unraveling of myself and putting it onto paper uh, and, and instruments. And then that kind of led to, to, to the album. And, Talking about your content, about what you're talking about within your songs. I mean, there's writing physically, synths and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, do you know when you're going in, or does the song come through you through channeling? Yeah. A lot of artists talk about it just sort of coming to you. That's a good question. I think that um, one, the first, a lot of the songs, like what, when I listen to Day Fever, Day Fevers, a lot of it sounds like it was, it was bang, it was conceptualized on a guitar or a piano. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of writers will tell you that they write around the drum beat or they go right into Pro Tools and they kind of create it from the foundation up. And uh, for me, it was all started on acoustic guitar or a piano. And I was really just trying to get my melodies going right. and uh, work on the story. And there's an economy, uh, the Swedes call it a melodic math. If you listen to some of those 90s Swedish written hit songs, right. Um, Cardigans? Yeah, or Den well, Dennis Pop Studio, Chiron Studios, right. they were, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, they, you know, they, like, Dr. Luke, Max Martin, they all come from that right. Dennis Pop world where they wrote, like, Ace of Bass, and right. they weren't even, ESL, like, English was the second language to them, mm -hmm. but, and if you listen to the lyrics that don't really make sense, but there's a melodic, the way they're, they have been flow with the consonants and the vowels. Right. So I really took to that. And ABBA. ABBA for sure, yeah, right? Great pop. And, uh, and then after the shell of the song was down, I would go on long runs and it's my form of like meditating on it. Uh, or there's something about moving in a car and listening to what you're working on. So I'd go on these long runs and I would listen to the playback of these really bad demos that I was working on. And then I would immediately go home and be like, oh, I came up with that idea, that idea. So it was this just learning how to build the sound, how I wanted it to sound. Right. Um, and then all the production stuff came later when I teamed up with Jay. Stay with us for more with Art Deco, including his video, and we meet Vancouver fashion designer, Evan Clayton. Hi, I'm Mike Fraser. Hi, I'm Gavin Froome. I'm Art Deco. 
I'm Wendy Biscuit. I'm Tim Hersey. We're Biscuits and Gravy. I'm Evan Clayton. Hi, this is Reese Fulber from Delirium and Conjure One. This is Dave Rave Ogilvy. We're Little Destroyer. I'm David Wilson. I'm Matt. And I'm Matt. We're the Matinee, and you're watching The Creators. You're watching The Creators. And you're watching The Creators. You're watching The Creators. And I'm wishing you a happy holidays. Wishing everybody happy holidays. And I want you to have a happy, happy holiday. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everyone. And have a Merry Christmas. Well, you worked with Jason Corbett, who we had on the show as actors, and you were in TV Heart Attack with him. And you, you guys had a, a great love for uh, 80 synth pop, the vibe in TV Heart Attack a bit too. And it, it, I think it spilled over into the, the record and, the, and certainly the video that we're going to be seeing in a moment. Um, I was just going to say as well that you're, you're playing with Midjur from uh, Ultravox. You know, dancing with tears in my eyes, an anthemic song at the rickshaw. Yeah. Um, so, what is it about particularly sonically analog synths? Why do you love them so much? Oh, they're just the best. What is not to like about an analog synthesizer? First of all, uh, they just talk about an instrument that can evoke an emotion uh, and make you feel cold and isolated and transport you back to the late 70s. I think of like the Cold War in Berlin when I close my eyes and I listen to like a, a warbly move or like a, a Jupiter or a Roland synth. I mean, I can get all techy and... David Bowie, low, Lodger, low, all of that. I mean, the Berlin trilogy for Bowie for yeah. sure. So going forward, uh, you, you're going to be pursuing with this career, but somebody coming up behind you, a younger person that might want to be doing music or an artist out there, can you give a little bit of advice about um, what, what, what it's like to pursue an art and sort of if you have a nugget of information that you can share about what to do as an artist or should you do art? So I'll be that one right there, yeah. sitting at home. Tell the, tell tell the people at home. Tell, tell them right in there. On this? Jim? Um, I we don't know who Jim that is. Everybody, Jim. It's a yeah. Everybody working back there is a Jim. So I think if you are wanting to get into this wacky show business, m making music gig, um, and you've got in it, uh, a real passion for it, go for it. Uh, it's it can be challenging. Um, I think that, you know, just to go back on what I said earlier about, you know, tell the truth and, and, and make it run, put it to a beat, whatever that kind of mantra is. All of my favorite musicians that I prescribe to as like an influence, and I dig into their interviews and I want to know everything about them, they all say the same thing. They all say, make it for you first. Right. Because that's, that's where the truth is, that's where the good art is. And um, if you're making it for somebody else or to get a record deal or to be famous, then, um, sorry, it's not gonna work. People are gonna smell that coming a mile away, so. They'll smell the rat. They'll smell the rat. So I think you gotta make it for you first and work really hard at it and try and find your own language, your own, your own vocabulary of how you're gonna express yourself. You know, right. mix and match, experiment, really well, go for it. We've, we've met Art Deco today, fantastic. I'll Never Give You Up is the video we're about to watch right now. A great hooky song. I encourage everybody out there to listen to it more than once. Listen to it twice, it'll be in your head, and you'll go back to it. It's a really quite undeniably a hooky song. I'm very proud of this. Thank you. I think it's one of the best songs I've heard come out of Vancouver in quite a long time. Um, not that I have any opinion that matters. No, but you know, I really, Can really we keep do. keep this rolling for yeah. a bit? <laughs> but it is very good. So, thank And thank you so much for taking the risk to, to, to do what you're doing, really, really, you're helping the music industry by showing that this is a really interesting thing. You cannot just, you don't just have to go on stage and crank out a song for people. You can be whoever you want up there. You're basically lots of people enjoying what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.
I'm here with Evan Clayton, and I'm very happy to have you on The Creators today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, part of the show is, uh, well, about fashion, too, because it's an art form. Just we do music, we do film, we do TV, we do all sorts of different things. Art gallery sculptors. Fashion lives with everybody day to day, and you are out there creating some beautiful fashions for people these days. Thank you. Yes. So let's talk about music for a second. You, you've mentioned that some of the artists that you really like and are inspired uh, by, you mentioned Lady Gaga. I oh, yeah. At some point. <laughs> of course, glamorous. Um, so what, what is it about music that uh, gets into you and transforms into your actual pieces? Like, how do you, how do you take the, that form and then show it through your art? I think it's more so interdisciplinary performance art, more so than uh, anything specific like music that I find inspiring. Um, and I think it's because every time I start a new collection, I approach it like I would if I was writing a story, for instance. So when I see someone that is doing something like music or any sort of performance-based art, it's almost like I get to flesh out their character through the clothing. Right. And that's what I find really inspiring. For the kid out there that might be like you living in Fruitvale when you were growing up, can, can you tell me a little bit about why you should go for it or not go for it? What's your advice? Um, go to school. That's the first thing. Um, it's great to be self-taught in terms of technical design, but I really think that surrounding yourself with people that have so much more, not just, ex not just experience in the industry, but life experience in general, is really great. Can you give some insight on what's a great way to present yourself as a fashion designer these days going forward? Um, for me, it's always about branding. Um, so I approach my branding with the level of professionalism, but I also keep in mind the fact that I am quite young and my designs tend to skew to a more of a youthful crowd. So for me, my branding is always about being relatable, but keeping my personal self separate. Are you trying to be political ever? Um, definitely. Um, I feel like before Warship, my two collections previous, Lilith and Death Proof, especially, were very political. Um, Death Proof was inspired by Quentin Tarantino films, and that was around the time that the Ferguson riots were happening. And the feminist movement was really at the forefront of pop culture around them. So it was about violence towards women and, and violence towards minorities. And um, same with Lilith to an extent, but more so towards uh, man's violence towards the environment. So how did you manifest that actually into a piece of clothing? Um, I don't think I ever did that in a specific piece. I do it more so with the actual show. Um, the clothes and the show sometimes are two totally separate entities. With the show, it's a lot easier to express those sort of things than, you know, to have a, a printed cotton dress that just says, you know, Rick Santorum is a douchebag. Um, which isn't really something that I do. So. Evan, thank you very much for letting us inside today on The Creators and getting up to know a little bit about you and inspiring others out there. And you're, you know, you're from Vancouver now. You're a Vancouver guy and making international ways. Congratulations and keep going and, and you're making us all proud. Thank you.